Hello everyone, Mike's back here. Brian Tafisek here as well. I uh, just want to make sure everyone can hear us. Uh, I have muted. Uh, we've had problems in the past with webinars of people trying to talk over us. So we're muting everyone just to make sure there's no background noise. But please, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat function. Uh, we're hoping this will be interactive. And if you have any thoughts on what we're talking about, uh, we'd be happy to turn this into a discussion. So thank you for joining us uh, for our experiment here. We're calling it the Traffic Corner. Uh, we're going to be running this webinar for the next five weeks, just a half an hour, so we can kind of share some of our thoughts and some of our interesting case studies and hopefully help everyone on who's watching. We're also going to be recording these and posting these uh, probably on YouTube, but stay tuned to that. And uh, with that, let's get rolling. Yeah. So uh, I'm Mike Spack. I'm founder of Spack Enterprises. Uh, written several industry manuals. Uh, very involved with ITE in my career, and also I'm assuming most of you know I blog at Mike on Traffic, and. Uh, as well as Brian Fisek here, he can tell you a little bit more about him. Yeah, vice president over here, co-authored on a, at least one of those manuals, um, but then I've been uh, on other webinars, ASCE ones, and coming up to a uh, conference next week for PTV, their users meeting, I'll be speaking at that one. So uh, talk about the difference between Vistro and Synchro. That's another topic. So if you're going to be at that PTV conference, please feel free to track Brian down and tease him a little bit. So before we get started uh, with the meat of the presentation, a little bit about SPAC Enterprise. Uh, we have SPAC Consulting. Uh, I, we're traffic, engine, traffic engineers. There's four of us here. I uh, do signal design, traffic impact studies, roundabout design. Uh, we get into a lot. Yeah. Jack of all trades. Uh, and then over at Counting Cars, we've developed our own hardware and software for doing traffic counts. Uh, and we started an online store about five years ago. And then Traffic Data Inc., that was the first business I started back in 2001, uh, just doing traffic counting for my buddies who were traffic engineers. And then we've layered on SPAC Academy with the different manuals and webinars and different online training tools we've developed and Mike on traffic my blog uh, been going strong since 2007 and lastly our newest endeavor is tripgeneration.org where we're as part of our internal processes collecting a lot of our own trip generation data to use locally and uh, we're sharing that out with kind of a quarterly email blast uh, we will be submitting data to ITE for inclusion in their manual, but uh, we want to make our data easily available and also provide the raw data in case anyone wants to do a lot more filtering. So over the next five weeks, uh, we'll be covering these topics. Uh, this week is really about talking about the pedestrian environment, and uh, we've worked on a couple of different corporate campuses here in Minnesota and had some unique challenges, but we have a couple of case studies we're going to walk through just to reinforce some of the principles we have. And again, this is an experiment we're running. We're going to do this for the next five weeks and then kind of evaluate, are, are we having an impact? Uh, let us know if you like this idea, if you think we're doing a good job or things we could do to make this better. And uh, after five weeks, we'll decide if we want to continue doing this. Going into the pedestrian environment, there's really kind of four keys, four key points that we're looking at. The first one as we look at pedestrian and, and their movements are can we simply eliminate the conflicts? Can we move them away from the crossing, move the vehicles away, move the pedestrians away? Can we just eliminate that crossing? A second point that we look at is um, <clears throat> is whether we can reduce the amount of conflict. So can we get through 
the uh, can we reduce the traffic going through? Can we reduce the pedestrians just instead of having lots of traffic going through? If anything we can reduce uh, helps us out there. So reduce, eliminate conflicts, just what I was talking about, just trying to to get rid of those conflicts, help pedestrians out so they don't they don't have to worry about the uh, crossing in the first place. So then from minimizing those conflicts, if you can shorten them in any way, so you can put in bump out to the pedestrian ramps, pull those in tighter to make the crossing shorter, uh, to kind of make the amount of time the pedestrians have to make that crossing. Those are things we look at. So if you think about an intersection where this would come into play is if you can use 11-foot uh, lanes, 10-foot lanes, is a right turn lane really needed? So it's, it's really about just trying to figure out how much, how much concrete does someone have to pass, so to speak, and then how much are they going to be out there where vehicles could get to them or could hit them. And then after that, of course, if you can slow down the vehicles, that definitely helps and, and let the drivers know that they're really in a, an environment where they should expect pedestrians. They're not out in the edge of the suburbs and cornfields where they're not going to see pedestrians very often. So somehow through the built environment, um, in the ideal world, not a ton of signs <laughs> because static signs don't, they, they kind of reinforce bad behavior if there aren't pedestrians around and you have these static signs saying, to be aware of the pedestrians, but kind of anything you can do to let people know they're in a changed environment, let them know they should be driving slow and be aware of a lot of people moving around. The first part of that too is increasing pedestrian awareness. This came up on one of our projects in particular where people were parking on one side, they had to cross a road to get to the other, to get to their building basically, and what we were noticing what uh, our, our client was noticing is that they get out of the car, they immediately pull their phone out, and they're not even paying attention to where they're walking. It's just looking at email, looking at uh, whatever it might be crossing the road. So, Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So really, it's kind of both sides there, making drivers and pedestrians aware of the crossing and, and just being aware of each other. And then lastly, kind of the four things we try to remember to look at is then get into active control where I talked about static signs with nobody around are not very effective uh, but actually having different beacon systems uh, the rapid flashing beacons or the old school pedestrian flashers but have them either be push button activated or better yet have sensors on them that are actuated by the pedestrians as they come up uh, about 10 years ago, we studied one of the first RFFBs in Minnesota that was put in at a cross, and we did a before-after study and found out that nobody was pushing the button. Uh, yeah. It was three out of 60 pedestrians were pushing the button. So um, no matter how good the technology is, if people don't push the button, it's worthless. So that was our big takeaway from that study. And then the next level for active control would be a Hawk system or a, just a standard traffic signal. And obviously, you're talking a lot more expense there and a lot higher thresholds in terms of uh, pedestrian crossings and everything. If you're if you're looking at that level, but but we did have options. to we did have to get into that with the hospital expansion we did, where the employee parking lot was across a busier collector road, and the straight path was definitely from this parking lot to get to the hospital for the employees and at shift changes big volumes of pedestrians it warranted and the hospital was willing to pay the almost two hundred thousand dollars I think when all was said and done to get the hawk signal in. Yep. So, all right. so example number one I, what we're looking at right here is the General Mills corporate campus in Golden Valley and to zoom in I'll let Bryant kind of set this up. So on this side you can see we've got the overview you can see a main access road coming in and kind of splits over here they've got a couple different parking lots uh, this is one of the main employee parking lots on this side, you, a few up here, but most people parked on this west side, which we have zoomed in here. And you can see they've got 
one ped crossing on this side, one ped crossing on this side. They had a couple that they removed, but you could see we, we had some, a lot of cars that would park here in crossing, but then a lot of people that would drive through. So you get the conflicts there between the, the peds and the drivers. And you can see as, as they're coming around, it straightens up. There's good sight distance. There's, um, makes it a little bit faster because it's got good sight distance and pretty flat. And then as people are coming up here, this, the way this Y is set up down here, the main route brings everyone this way and up. Um, even if they're deliveries or whatever, you, you know, if you're headed to this area, chances are you're headed this way. So a lot of traffic coming through. So a lot of people, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm remembering right, they would come and they'd start to see that the first lot was full and then they would be pushed here. So as this was filling up and the pedestrians coming, it was prime time for then people to make the decision at Correct. this Y point to go to the secondary lot, the less desirable lot. So it was kind of set up <laughs> to almost promote this crossing traffic that we want to be minimizing. Yes. So as we talked about the team and we went back to uh, those four principles. One, can we minimize or reduce? Um, well, first, can we remove it? So that's where we started with how can we, how could we just eliminate this so there are no crossings? And we looked at could this access road be flipped to the backside, put all the parking adjacent to the building, or could this road be cut off and redirect people on the other side? And so those were the the first two we looked at in terms of eliminating the conflict altogether. And yeah, those are big changes, expensive changes to try to make those and not really willing where the client was willing to go. Yeah, and then we talked about kind of a hybrid in the middle instead of redoing this area, could we turn this into one-way flow? and try to force people around to get to that lot and make it one way. So the aisle hugging here was coming down to force people in this unnatural pattern. But again, <laughs> a definitely private scenario and uh, the facilities folks in charge of improving this, uh, we're only willing to go so far with us. Um, so those ideas were kind of off yeah. the table pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Yep. Even though we think they actually would have solved, we think we could have solved the problem by reworking the traffic and pedestrian flow by putting in diverters and realigning yep. the parking lots. So going away from those options, then now we were looking at what can we do to reduce the exposure time. And so this is where we really started looking at these individual crossings and how wide they were, where they were in terms of you know, another little parking lot off here. So you had some big radius. These are wider than wider than your standard 11 or 12 foot lanes on each side. And um, so that's where we started with looking at how can we bump that out or put a center median in, but basically trying to reduce that distance. Yeah, and we're so that we started talking strategies around trying to narrow that up, um, and we kind of do you change the do you do new curb work here or something we've had success with for these experiments starting out just get some orange barrels out there or some cones some pylons just to start the experiment. And then uh, we've moved in a couple of scenarios to having big potted planters, kind of the size you need to move around with a small bobcat, but ones that are portable. And huge upside of those is you can create the positive narrowing and put planters on each side of the crossing to, to let the crossing still be there and not change anything but you're also not changing any of the drainage. So you don't have to worry about storm sewers or anything like that in this scenario by using those temporary potters and they can make them look as nice as they want. One of the things we 
briefly considered too as we were looking at it is if we could narrow everything up for the whole corridor up and down but with the truck traffic going through there that that didn't make sense it'd be nice just from a standpoint of slowing traffic down but with this, it was just determined that we should probably just focus on the crosswalks. If we can get the slowdown through the crosswalks, have a minimal distance for that crossing, that should be good enough. So that's where we focused our, our efforts we on did, this one. And again, another thing, they weren't excited about a physical change, but if we could close those two driveways and maybe have a little inlet outlet there for the VIP parking, Again, that would have cleaned this up to have less conflicts there, um, but they didn't want to change anything physical. We also talked about, <laughs> they, they wanted us to do this study and seemed very open at the beginning, but we also talked about, okay, do we make the crossings, do we make one big crossing right here, or do we, should we shift these crossings was a big question mark, um, but again, they were not that excited about yeah. <laughs> making much physical changes. Then, so they like the idea of reducing the uh, crossing distance there. So that was one of the suggestions they went with. And then the other thing we started looking at too was can we slow traffic or provide more awareness of the crossings? And from the pedestrian awareness side, they were already doing a good job of that. They had. Um, some education campaigns going on for the workers just to let them know what was going on and to be aware, keep your eyes up, that sort of thing. So good from that standpoint. Uh, so then we looked at what can we do to try to slow vehicles down better. And so from that standpoint, some of the suggestions we got was throwing stop signs out there, uh, speed table, speed bumps, uh, those type of uh, those types of uh, construction things that could marginally help, but we would we tend to stay away from them. The stop signs, yeah, especially the stop signs. Yeah, we don't, it's, we don't think they're very effective. Um, we're very judicious when it comes to stop and yield signs. Um, kind of, we believe the data bears out that kind of creates a false positive. Um, people think it's doing something, but people still blow the stop signs or roll through them. But it makes the pedestrians feel safer, and they look at their phones more. Yeah. Um, so uh, that we, of all the traffic calming measures, and after studying traffic calming for 20 years now, uh, speed humps are definitely statistically have the most impact. Um, but they have the most impact because they're the most disruptive. And ideally, you want them placed every 100 to 200 feet, so you're positively slowing down the traffic, and they don't have room to accelerate to make up the lost time. Uh, if you yes. put, put the speed humps every 600 feet, uh, people will just gun it in the middle uh, to make up for that lost time. So speed humps are very effective when you're willing to <laughs> roll them out. <laughs> um, but they are disruptive, and especially with trucking behaviors in here. Um, so speed tables were also a viable option, but again, more construction and working around drainage. So kind of they wanted us to go cheapest to most expensive <laughs> in laying yes. out the options. I think the last item we looked at on this one, there are those um, middle of the road, pedestrian signs that you can put up, just warning to stop for pedestrian, watch for pedestrian, that type of thing. That was another one we suggested. Again, it gets, depending on how much they were going to end up shortening that crossing distance, you might not be able to put that in there with the truck traffic that would come through that could get knocked down quite a bit, but it's another option that if you narrow a couple feet on each side, you throw the sign in the middle, that's going to provide more awareness that the PEDs are there. It's going to slow people down as they try to just get through that crossing too. So, and then the last of the four things to look at uh, is going over the active kind of the flashing signs, the beacons, and uh, again, the expense there. We brought it up and we could put active flashers at the crosswalks. 
um, but really they'd be flashing almost continuously during that half hour in the morning when everybody's coming to work and kind of it seemed like everyone who was saw the lot full and going to that secondary lot already knew there were pedestrians there so we didn't think that that would provide much positive benefits um, we laid it out as an option and cost put the cost rough cost there for them of different options all the way to hawk signals um, but it's something we shied away from in this circumstance so just kind of wrapping this up as we put a document together and delivered on this one we talked about these four items that we look at and then we went through each one to present those options and then that allowed them to look at it think about it more and really figure out what were they willing to do and that's getting feedback from them really honed down to shortening the distance um, potentially looking at speed humps that's where then we we worked with them to provide a, a concept plan of, of how that would move forward. So kind of two stages working with them. Okay. So in our last seven minutes, we'll kind of jump through a second example. Uh, and this is a little grocery store. Uh, the grocery That's store. an office building on this side. So um, multi-level, lots of people coming over here. You have a grocery store on this side. Uh, access point, two access points coming in. There's an alley kind of on the back side here where people could also come in. And let's see. So if we focus in, this is the area of concern. And in particular, what they were looking at is people coming in and parking, and then they're crossing here, and this was a main access point. More people seem to turn in here, even though the second one was available. So this, right in front of the grocery store, was where our main conflicts were and um, what they brought us in for to take a look at. So kind of, again, going back to our, our four kind of categories of options, first it's, well, can we just close this driveway and, and reconfigure the lot and just flat out eliminate this problem of, the pedestrians being able to come here to the front door of the grocery store without having any vehicles crossing. And there's there's kind of two ways we looked at that too. You could close it but still leave this circulation road around. So it's just you don't have access to the street. Most of your traffic would come in here and they could park. That would definitely cut down, not eliminate. Um, and then the other way would, um, if you reconfigured it and uh, switch the parking somewhat. There's ways to reconfigure the parking to try to get that better too, but uh, both of those, again, not really the way they wanted to, to go. So uh, we had to move down the list and think of, okay, what else can we do in terms of our next step, reducing the exposure? Yeah, and we talked about could we make this a one-way flow through the lot using the two driveways, go to angled parking or something like that, but Again, uh, it seems when landowners have parking problems, it's well after they've put in all their capital expenses and they're not real excited about spending six figures or more uh, in pavement and curb to reconfigure something that they thought was okay from the beginning. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, so next option is shortened crossings. And this became Similar to the last one, it, this is a wide area in here. You can see, you know, feeds right out. We're probably, I, I want to say this was 32 feet, 34 feet, somewhere in that range. So there is a lot of width there. So we had some of the same suggestions that they could do in terms of the planters or other things to just try to get vehicles to, one, move slowly through as there's more uh, impediments in their way, but then also the exposure time gets dropped as you reduce four, six, eight feet out of there to try to uh, reduce that crossing. So th kind of the last two um, active uh, of putting in some kind of flashing beacon, that really doesn't seem <laughs> appropriate in a small parking lot like this. Um, but kind of awareness between the pedestrians and the vehicles. Again, we didn't have a lot we thought about because it's a tight parking lot. 
uh, people should expect pedestrians and vehicles to be mixing there. One item we did bring up though is you can see they, they kind of have a crossing here, here, and there were faint marks on this side. They actually had three separate crossings, all of them with faded paint. So rather than maintain those, one of our suggestions was, well, at least paint the whole area and give it new paint or however to get that whole striping area there so that you're not just looking out at one little area, you're looking through this whole crossing area because people could come from various directions. Uh, I'm sure most people have seen that at the big box stores where they just stripe out a whole big area and you, you expect pedestrians in that in that section. Yeah, but it, it was such a tight parking lot. When you think about a Home Depot or a Target, they'll often put stop signs up at that main crossing area. We were concerned about stopping here and having a queue spill back onto the main road and creating a bigger safety problem with vehicles mixing at 25 to 30 miles an hour out on the main street uh, versus coming in to the parking lot. So we opted not to do the stop sign. Um, we recommended fresh paint, put some planters, tighten it up out there. Even though if us as traffic engineers could really work our magic, I think we would have like to have closed one of the driveways or converted it to a one-way flow so we would have only had half as much traffic at each of the driveways. Yep. Um, so that was going through our list in another area. So we get pulled in routinely to kind of do these parking assessments of things that aren't quite working. As you can tell from our discussion, we have lots of ideas and there's lots of options, but most property owners aren't excited about spending the big bucks. So Usually what ends up happening is paint and planters and things like that trying to tighten up the scenarios. Um, but we also like to take this critical look at any of our imp traffic impact studies. And when we're working on new developments, we try to actually <laughs> try to look through these kinds of scenarios and, and solve problems through design before things get built. Yeah. When it's still on paper, that's the best time to try to solve that. So... Um, and just kind of wrapping this up here, um, like we said from the first example, when we get these, we do like to separate them out, kind of two opportunities to talk with the client. The first one is to go through our four steps and just get the ideas out there. Could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And you don't have to go into a lot of detail in text, but just throw out the basics, let them know what you're thinking about and then once you have that conversation and they can hone in a little bit on what's feasible from their end, that's when you can really dive into the details and say, okay, this is where we think you need to go then given the parameters you've set. So. Okay, I don't see any questions or comments in the chat. Hopefully I'm looking at that right. And uh, so appreciate any feedback you have. Feel free to email us back. Um, questions, comments, feedback, always appreciated, and uh, we hope you'll join us next week, uh, or if you're watching the recording, to jump on next week live, and uh, once we get through a month of doing this, let us know, do you think this has value, and we should keep going. Uh, other than that, sorry for the technical difficulties, yeah. definitely a lesson learned there. Uh, we'll do a better job of getting everything preloaded and tested out, but thanks for bearing with us and helping us in the experiment. Yeah. Appreciate it.